My name is Patrick Mullins from the Australian High Hello. Commission. We're very happy to have you all here today. Uh, this is the first of a series called Stay Connected, Stay Informed and Shape the Future, a series dedicated for an engagement between our High Commissioner, uh, Mr. Pat, Barry everyone Obama, is sending a message that they can't hear you. And uh, uh, our panellists, of expert alumni panellists that we'll have every month. This first session is on cybersecurity, an issue of only increasing importance to us all. Uh, I just want to run through a few house rules uh, for this session before I pass on to the High Commissioner. Um, first of all, uh, if I could ask uh, through the session if we could turn off... Patrick? Sorry to interrupt you, but you're very, very soft and there are lots of messages saying that they can't hear you. Oh, okay. I can't. So maybe move closer to the mic. Okay, thank you. Cheers. So, is that better? Much better. Oh, great. So um, anyway, a few house rules. Um, happy for everyone to have their webcams on, but if we're having bandwidth issues, we'll let you know and we'll ask people to turn off webcams. Uh, please keep yourself muted throughout the session. Uh, of course, unless you're talking. In, ca in the case of connect connectivity issues, please re-log in for the session. In case the connection drops off from our end, please stay on and we'll connect right back. Thank you for the tr amazing and the quality of the question, amazing number and the quality of questions we, we have received for this session. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to them all today. Uh, some of them we will look to put to take forward for future sessions. So thank you very much for all your questions. But without further ado, I'm very uh, uh, honoured today to hand over to our High Commissioner, Mr Barry O'Farrell, who will make some remarks. Well, everybody, welcome to this webinar. It's a great pleasure to be joining with our distinguished alumni panellists, as well as with all of you. Um, our alumni are an integral part of the Australia-India relationship. Uh, the India Economic Strategy highlighted the importance of alumni to our relationship, and that's a sentiment endorsed by the Australian Government. And I know that my Consul General colleagues and I place a high priority on hearing and talking with you. And I would just remind you, if you've just come on, mute your microphones. Today, the Australia-India relationship is at an all-time high. Both countries increasingly view each other as natural partners. We have much to share and learn from each other, not the least in cyber security, the topic of this discussion. I'm delighted that I'll be interacting with you each month through our Stay Connected, Stay Informed, Shape the Future webinar series featuring distinguished Australian alumni. And I hope you'll participate, not just tonight, but in future sessions as well. Today's topic of cyber security is an issue of vital importance to both business and government. COVID-19 has brought tremendous changes to our lives, including border diplomacy. When I took up this posting in February, I expected to be travelling the country, getting to meet alumni, other partners and stakeholders, and of course, doing so face to face. But thanks to them, the pandemic, like you, I find myself almost ex exclusively uh, engaging through digital forums. And we've all become well versed with the very digital platforms available. A consequence of all this uh, virtual communication we're doing is it's reminded to all of us of the importance of safe and open online environments. Even before COVID-19, it was clear that the, the internet now lies at the heart of most modern businesses and is a critical enabler of growth. Government, businesses and individuals around the world are reporting increasing incidents of malicious cyber activity by both state and non-state actors. So it's no surprise that cyber affairs and critical technologies are also areas of cooperation between Australia and India. Both countries are committed to ensuring that the internet doesn't present risks to security, liberty or prosperity. During last month's virtual summit, Prime Ministers Morrison and Modi announced agreements covering a wide range of areas, including on cyber 
and critical technology. Under a framework arrangement on cyber security and cyber enabled critical technology, the two countries will work together to promote and preserve an open, free, safe and secure internet, including by shaping the rules and norms governing new technologies, such as in artificial intelligence, quantum computing and robotics. And that joint framework sets out practical actions to enhance digital trade, harness critical technology opportunities and address cyber security challenges. The Australian and Indian governments also hold regular bilateral cyber dialogues between officials and the third bilateral India-Australia cyber dialogue took place in September last year. The meeting agreed a program of reciprocal expert exchanges to share information on cyber security policy development, telecommunications, legislative developments and of course engagement with the private sector. The officials from both our countries discussed and continue to talk about emerging ICT technologies, the Internet of Things, national approaches to cyber security policy and legislation, multilateral efforts to cooperate, for example, through the United Nations Group of government, Governmental Experts, an open-ended working group, and of course, cybercrime. You will have seen or heard that Australia has recently announced its largest ever investment to strengthen its cyber security capabilities. More than 7,000 crore rupee or 135, 1.35 billion Australian dollars will be invested to build cyber resilience and create and, and recruit 500 new cyber experts in Australia. So the topic of this webinar is both relevant and timely for all of us. Let me again by thanking all of you who've joined us for what should prove to be an interesting discussion and thank in advance our distinguished alumni panellists, Ayush, Dewey and Lokesh, for their time and their wisdom in this discussion. And it's great to see so many people online. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, High Commissioner, uh, for setting us off on what we are really interesting discussion tonight and getting particularly that government to government perspective, which I think is a really important overlay for where we can go. Um, our first speaker, uh, from the alumni expert panelists is Juhi Ahmed. She's a communication consultant and startups mentor. Uh, Ms. Ahmed is a communications professional. She's had 25 years of global work experience in Australia, India, and the US. She has traveled in the corporate sector in areas and worked in areas including technology, education, entrepreneurship, and nonprofits. So thank you very much, Juhi, over to you. Okay, just unmuting my mic. Thank you very much. And thank you, High Commissioner, for hosting us uh, and to the entire High Commission team in Delhi and, and in, of course, the team members in Chennai who've invited us to this panel. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was this is actually a really, despite the scenario, the setting that we're in with COVID, being able to connect with all the alumni in this way is the first time that I'm doing it a virtual meeting where we're actually getting to hear voices from say, I heard Delhi, Chennai, Bangalore, Madras, um, you know, other parts of India. And so that's the really nice part of this virtual meeting. So that's a good, good initiative. So thank you for that. Just a little bit about me, um, brief introduction. You've already done most of it, Patrick, thank you. Um, I've been living in India now for the last close to 15 years. And uh, of those 15, I did 12 plus at Microsoft where I had the opportunity to connect with a lot of technology experts and dev experts. Um, I've also worked as a journalist at the ABC in Melbourne. Um, I've done a little bit of work at Bollywood, which is my interesting little mix um, in my career. I have my husband, Tony, lives here in Hyderabad and we're both hunkered down in Hyderabad uh, at the moment since March. And I have two children, Taj, who's in Melbourne and Zia, our daughter in Vancouver. So that's the sort of overall perspective about me. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the fact that what, what COVID has presented in terms of um, cybersecurity issues. I did a lot of research um, in the lead up to this conversation with a number of representatives from senior representatives from um, a lot of IT companies, including Microsoft, Google, SAP. Um, and a few others are working in this space. And it seems to me that 
cyber security has been at its highest um, in terms of hacks and scams and um, problems that people are facing because everyone's working from home. There's been a relaxation of the access uh, rules for people to be able to access business um, confidential information. Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi points have been opened up. Um, and so you've seen this explosion of random hacking happening all across the world, as I understand it. And pretty much all the Fortune 500 companies stand have had to ramp up very quickly. They may have had contingencies and disaster recovery plans in place already, but it's been a huge strain on the infrastructure that each company faces. And maybe till about April, I think companies were struggling to get up to speed with a lot of unexpected attacks and, and defending a lot of uh, scams. I just want to mention most recently, just yesterday, we had um, a cryptocurrency scam that came out of Twitter. Um, I'm not sure if many of you heard about it, but it happened overnight uh, where you know hackers got into use some special tool of Twitter's and managed to get into very important, prominent people's accounts. And people like Joe Biden and um, um, you know Elon Musk have had cryptocurrency scams running off their Twitter handles, encouraging people to pay Bitcoin into the cryptocurrency in 35 minutes or, you know, and they get double their money in back. So these are the kinds of things we're seeing. Um, I myself have used a lot of, have been online a lot uh, in the last, you know, since March 22nd, really. And uh, I'm finding that um, more and more, uh, there are other things that are happening you know, just from our behavioral changes on how we're working, we're becoming far more productive. In fact, we're probably becoming too productive uh, because you're always on your machines and always working to sort of um, meet deadlines that you would typically have a couple of days to work on. So just, I'm gonna pause there and say that um, I'm happy to take, take questions in relation to, you know, what the situation is. But I also want to say that the opportunities for India and Australia, from a point of view of collaboration, are enormous, tackling the skills gap that exists for cyber security in both countries, um, breaking down boundaries, sharing intelligence without breaching confidentiality policies, uh, something that's already happening. The IT industry does this a lot. They, you know, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they all share information without compromising their competitive intelligence to protect each other. I think we can see that happening in between India and Australia in a big way. And the fact that there's already existing um, relationships that have started between Australia and, you know, I'm going back several years, it's not just the most current thing, but the fact that we have universities such as Deakin or Macquarie, um, New South Wales, they're all working in India to bring cyber security expertise to this country to bring commercial interests and to have an exchange uh, with uh, Australian companies. So it's a benefit, a benefit for both countries, I would say. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Judy. That's a really nice overlay, I think, for some of the emerging challenges we have and where the, the seeds have already been planted for Australia and India cooperation, including amongst universities. Now going on to our next panellist, Mr. Ayush Prabedi. He is the co-founder and director of Audasix Bengaluru. Um, he's a graduate of Monash University and the University of Melbourne. Uh, Ayush started as a management consultant for us and Young. And uh, we're very, very happy to have him here with us today. Over to you, Ayush. Thanks, Pat. Um, and can I just say, um, I'm going to catch up with you afterwards, just find out where you got that vest from. It's, that's smashing, mate. Uh, I need to, to grab myself one of those as well. Um, thank you, uh, Pat, and thank you, High Commissioner, for, for hosting this. I think um, this is going to turn out to be a really valuable forum going forward. Uh, so, uh, you know, apart from what Pat has already said about me, um, uh, I guess uh, I, I'm deep in the cybersecurity space uh, with my company, Audacix. Uh, what we do is we work with a lot of mid-market and enter large enterprise uh, clients around the world, uh, some smaller ones as well. Um, and we help them do two things. Uh, we help them make sure that the software is free of bugs 
and free of security vulnerabilities. So um, uh, I, I jumped at the chance uh, to join this discussion because it was right down my alley, if you like. Um, in terms of uh, how we do this, uh, we've got a couple of products. Uh, we've got QSIM, which does the software, automated software testing. So testing someone for using bots. Uh, and then we have uh, CyberChief, which is our uh, vulnerability scanning and vulnerability management tool. And the, the genesis for my sort of journey in, in cybersecurity was um, uh, a few projects ago, we were doing something um, for a government agency. We were doing some pen testing. And within an hour of starting the project, uh, one, uh, our security tester was able to pretty much download the whole uh, use a database without any login credentials, right? And uh, you can imagine um, it would have been a big PR disaster, but it would have actually have been a, a, a massive privacy blow to every citizen who, who was interacting with that agency and consuming those the, the services online, right? And it got, it got us to, to think that there needs to be a better way in this day and age of helping IT professionals who are not cybersecurity experts make sure that they're building the right security controls into the products that they're developing, right? And typically, what we find is, or what we did find was most cybersecurity tool sets that were out there were targeted cybersecurity experts. And now we know for a fact that with all the government research that's gone out is that we already have many thousands of uh, cybersecurity jobs which need to be filled, but we simply don't have the, the people for them around the world, right? And we're not going to get those people in the next, you know, three, four, five years even, I, I don't think. So what we said about doing was building a tool for uh, software development teams, which would allow them to find vulnerabilities in their applications before they went live. And just to qualify that, um, most of the software that we use these days, New versions of that are, be, are being released maybe daily, maybe weekly, definitely fortnightly, right? So if you're relying on, if software teams are relying on external experts to help them, uh, that adds up to a lot of money and it adds up to a lot of inefficiencies, right? So uh, what the, the, the approach we took uh, was, and I know this is a big part of the, of the whole India-Australia cybersecurity um, strategic alliance, is that uh, there needs to be some sort of capability upliftment as well, right? So the tool we built uh, not only uh, helps uh, software engineers find vulnerabilities, but it also helps them understand a bit more about the security controls that they need to build in using the programming languages which they're familiar with, right? Using the same programming languages which are building their software. And by, by doing that, uh, we're, helping, um, we're helping software teams uh, I'm going to use a, a tech term here, shift left. Essentially, do more of this uh, security testing work earlier in the development piece so that uh, we can focus on the 20% the, the which will really make a difference later on when, when timelines are really tight, right? Mm -hmm. We're using the whole 80-20 uh, format there. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do with our CyberChief tool was uh, also give IT decision makers a way to baseline and understand uh, what their application security posture was like, right? Uh, one of the things that is holds cybersecurity back, I think, is that it's often seen as just a cost center uh, in, in big companies and in small companies, right? Uh, you, you go to a city management and go, I need X amount of dollars or rupees for cybersecurity. They're like, what's the ROI? And that's really hard to quantify, right? But I think if we if we position this correctly, and if we position the analytics correctly, we can help to change uh, that conversation about what are we really doing here with those with that investment that we're putting in. And so, part of, of what CyberChief is is also a way to measure and track uh, you, you know, your application security resilience for for senior management. And uh, look, I, I could talk for days about this. So before I do that and start boring you all, let me just quickly say that um, I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, DFAT and the Australian government uh, and um, High Commissioner your team in India, uh, Janki and, and her colleagues, uh, for the for the monetary and the non-monetary support they've given us in, in building out CyberChief. Um, it's been a great help so far, and I'm, I'm count we're all counting on your continued support going forward.
Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to give us a sense of actually what cybersecurity really means when it comes to businesses. Um, uh, I must admit, when we look at it from a government end, we approach it from a different way. And I think it's important we increase our conversations together so we build a bit more of a common understanding. So thanks very much for that. No worries. Uh, so now uh, our next speaker is Mr. Bosh <coughs> Payek. Uh, he is the Chief of Digital Enterprise for Bosch Engineering and Business Solutions. Um, he is responsible for establishing and scaling up uh, the business in areas of the industrial internet of things for emerging markets, including India, Mexico, Turkey, South Africa, and ASEAN. And I think in terms of our work, he brings a lot, lot to the table for this discussion. So thanks very much, Lokesh, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. It's, it's quite surprising. I got an email last week that I've been invited for that. Well, it's it, it, indeed a special because it brought me back my Australian yeah. memories. I, I, did my, I did my MBA from Lathrop way back in 2002 to 2004. And, uh, and the term IoT also got inbuilt into me because of Australia. Way back in 2010, uh, 11, yeah, I was in Sydney attending the first IoT conference on behalf of Bosch. So that fueled in, and uh, I currently manage an industrial IoT business. That's a digital enterprise. When it's a digital enterprise, that's mainly to do with manufacturing companies. Bosch being a global conglomerate, mainly to using Bosch products either in the car or in the home, and we build those 140 plus years of ex uh, overall existence. And for us, the conversation is leading towards turning from a mere component manufacturer to an IoT company. And we started this journey in 2012. We're turning ourselves as an IoT company because we are the largest electronic company and we firmly believe that going further, electronics is going to be connected. It's already being connected and it's going to go further into it, where you can talk to that electronics, give instruction to electronics and start getting instruction. Action back to that. So that's the reason when we knew which has 20,000 strong engineering associates sitting in India, Germany, Mexico, and Vietnam, and also supporting over 28 plants worldwide. So we develop those softwares which get into automotive with home appliances which get into hydraulics. The land is operated by Bosch can control. So any, you can imagine a small difference or a small change in the software. Someone who got into a beautiful hackathon for himself and that led to a lot outside. So we do understand when you get into car, imagine cars are going to be further vulnerable to for a lot of security issues similar to the manufacturing companies. In a manufacturing company, if you look at a technology stack of connectivity to the cloud, a lot of data getting generated as you go further. Anything you look at, whether it's an automotive component, appliances, or a steel manufacturer, or a textile manufacturer. In last five years of my, I have interacted with multiple companies in India, and also a few of the companies in Turkey, Mexico, US, and few in ASEAN, and we have noticed that while the manufacturing may sound easy because the data is all in the paper, but that turning into a lot of digital information storing that lead to a probably a cybersecurity threats. Hence, we Bosch have invested close to 300 to 400 million euros into AI as per year. And in that part, significant percentage has kept aside for cybersecurity algorithms, cybersecurity, AI engines to build in so that every product we give to our customer 
is well secured because there are a lot of data get generated also on that. So as we go further, happy to answer. Indeed, a special pleasure to be here. I look forward for the conversation. Thanks very much for that, Lakesh. Um, I might ask, we just had a little bit of trouble hearing you towards the end there. I'm just wondering if you might be able to switch off your camera for the uh, question and answer session. Um, so now we get to the fun part where thank you to all of you who have provided questions. Uh, we've got so many and obviously we won't have time to get through the, all of them today. But um, we have gone through them, and as I mentioned earlier, some of them we will look to address in the next session. Some of them will, I think, carry on, um, and we will get back to you on those. Uh, but uh, I wanted to start with uh, a couple, a few questions for the High Commissioner. Um, and I might start with the first one, which is from Ashke Kumar Seth, uh, who says that. I think the world has learned that it can't rely or depend on China. What measure, what measure is Australia taking to promote its relationship with a country like India? And can we expect the business between the two countries to, to grow to a record high? Over to you, High Commissioner. Well, that's that's certainly the goal. That's certainly my mission. It's the it's the it's the baton that I picked up from Harinda. Uh, and that we're all aimed on, and notwithstanding COVID, I think uh, we should be optimistic because the virtual leaders meeting last month between our two prime ministers uh, not only elevated the relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership, but signed a number of uh, agreements and MOUs and arrangements which will assist uh, us to do business in a variety of areas from, uh, from agriculture and water resources through to the sort of technology we're talking about uh, presently. So uh, I think I think uh, COVID has provided an opportunity for India and Australia to better align. I think uh, it's clear that both countries uh, have a greater appreciation of their responsibilities across the Indo-Pacific region and are determined, in the words of Prime Minister Modi, to fulfil their sacred duty in delivering a secure and free, and prosperous uh, Indo-Pacific. And I think that provides uh, uh, lots of opportunities. As I sit here today, um, you know, we know that pomegranates can go for the first time into Australia. Uh, we know that uh, down in uh, in the south, uh, a good malt barley is being used to produce uh, uh, a beer, uh, boutique beers. Uh, so, um, and, at, and at other levels, of course, uh, including in <coughs> cyber security and cyber technologies, uh, we are seeing already startup companies. Uh, 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 on both sides of the Indian Ocean, uh, engaging uh, in the other country. Thanks very much, High Commissioner. Um, a question that a few people uh, provided, including Arajit Banerjee from the <laughs> Association of India. Thanks, Arajit. Uh, Ratna Singh and Rohit Bashkaran. What is Australia's strategy for cybersecurity? How is Australia teaming up with India to handle? The audio is very low, man. Can you make it a little louder? So I'll repeat that question um, that came from a few people. Uh, what is Australia's strategy on cyber security? How is Australia teaming up with India to handle a war in cyber, if any? Um, I'm going to be relatively brief on this because uh, there's a good document online which was the Australian government's announcement uh, two weeks ago on boosting cyber security. Uh, it sets out in great detail um, the sorts of approaches that Australia is taking. And uh, what we know is that uh, with the Indian government, like good friends, we will share learnings. We will, we will ensure that, uh, uh, that uh, we've had experiences or where India's had experiences, we'll seek to learn from those experiences. And I know, for instance, at a time when uh, 5G continues to be topical, where we're seeing this by Britain that there has been interest in Australia's decision on 5G uh, and, I, and, we, and we know that uh, every country in the world in a sense is, uh, is having to make those decisions. So 
you know, at uh, at a, a security level, at a government level, at a defence level, uh, do have interaction. Uh, but importantly, I th for this audience, that uh, that a lot of this is driven at the business to business level, if not um, because of uh, of the technology being created, as we've heard tonight, uh, by the people uh, through the startups uh, uh, who then. Uh, sell their wares and apply their wares to areas that uh, continue to concern us. Obviously, one of the key areas in which we'll continue to cooperate with India is trying to shape those uh, those norms and rules that will will determine the way in which we interact virtually um, uh, and in cyber. Uh, because uh, we want to ensure that it's an enabler of people, it's an enabler of freedom and prosperity, and not used for other means. Thanks very much. Um, uh, one final question, uh, boss, uh, and I think you you probably covered this a little bit, but I, I want to put it to you. Um, is that from Ritu David? Thank you, Ritu. The defence budget is still very heavy on kinetic force. While we have acknowledged asymmetric warfare tactics like cyber warfare is important, why is there not a proportionate shift in the budget? Do you see that happening in the next budget? Well, I think there is a proportionate shift in the budget, and uh, uh, even even for me and my my struggle still with Indian numbers, seven thousand crore rupees uh, investment is a significant investment, uh, and I can only see it going in one direction because I don't believe anyone on this uh, on this link tonight believes that uh, the challenges that we face as we press further and further into the cyber world are going to get any less. So Australia is trying to be nimble, it's trying to be agile, it's trying to cover all bases. Uh, as we seek not only to combat uh, uh, cyber cyber challenges, uh, but also to provide a strong deterrent to ensure that we have that security required in the Indo-Pacific region, upon which we can base strong economies and deliver the prosperity that people expect. Thanks very much, High Commissioner. Juhi, one for you from Hitesh Kumar. With the lockdown situation across the globe, Usage of technology has spiked, and with the digital th th uh, theft has increased as well. How does one ensure that one has the ground covered? Thank you. Um, so the first thing I want to mention, though, is that with COVID, we've seen lifeline technologies like the one that we're using right now, WebEx, Zoom, Google Meet, uh, and of course, Office Teams, all becoming very important modes of communication. So that's the upside, that we've been able to work from home. We've been able to do a lot of work uh, that has been enabled by lifeline technologies such as this. The downside, of course, is there's been a spike um, of uh, multiple threats from different uh, areas. And how do I see it being addressed? I mean, if I once again uh, talk about what I've heard from people who are actually grappling with these real life issues every day. Um, we're never gonna be able to be completely on top of, uh, we're never gonna be completely cyber secure. That's the first thing. We're always gonna be catching up in some shape or form because there is going to be uh, advanced technologies that we come up with. There'll be someone coming up with something tomorrow to address those advanced technologies. So it's, 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 a, it's not a very, um, positive picture that I want to paint. And I'm hoping uh, Ayush can add and so can Lokesh as to what are the, the, the good scenarios that we can see. I, I do see that technology innovation is obviously key to uh, addressing uh, cybersecurity and m mitigating issues, um, but it's never really going to be a situation where we're gonna be say that, say that we're totally secure. So I just wanna say that. I want to paint the worst picture possible simply because I think there's a lot of work that has to be done from countries like Australia, from other <coughs> countries around the world, and India, where we have this rich talent pool of people who are technology innovators already. I mean, you have this amazing development technology um, skills here that can be used and can be leveraged. And if there's some way we can, as, as, as Ayush mentioned, it's not going to happen like next year or something, but if we work towards addressing the skills gap, if we work to having more people in cybersecurity, uh, you know, from a policy point, from a perspective, from a development perspective, we could probably mitigate it and reduce it. Um, but it's here to stay.
Thanks, Juhi. Um, I might, uh, we might switch to Lukesh now, and if we have time, we might come back to another question for you, and we'll see how we go in the time. Uh, a question, Lakesh, from Aparajita Banerjee. Considering that West Bengal is the pivot for the Act East policy, according to various experts, that has initiated several connectivity projects, such as Bangladesh, India, China, Myanmar, and that the Myanmar Economic Corridor. And it also shares proximity to other East Asian and Southeast Asian countries. It would be crucial to safeguard against any potential cyber threats uh, that affect supply chains in this area, in these regional nodes, specifically ports and other transit points. Lakesh, based on your work in the region, can you throw some light into what is being done at the regional le the regional level in this area? Uh, thanks for the question. Pretty, pretty uh, point of a conviction there. It's not just uh, West, it's across India, right? Uh, we have worked with one of our clients uh, who makes tires. And that tire, anyone can make out, a tire is like you fix in the car and you buy for one time. But they wanted to get into a different business model where the tire would be offered as a service. How would you offer it as a service? When you offer it as a service, you're going to put a sensor into the tire so that you can start monitoring a real-time data when the tire is just attached to the uh, adjusted uh, to the vehicle and you start getting the real information coming out of it. So there's a lot of enormous of data that's connected to the vehicle driver behavior and that's connected to you getting uh, right insights to offer right service. So here, when you are selling tire as one time, it's one time money you're coming in, but you're looking at a revenue which is going to come across as you go further offering. That's a revenue model. But you also have to be very, very careful that you're getting collecting the data on real time basis from that particular vehicle, which would even though the data is information required to you offer the service, but there are a lot of possibility that you're also taking location data, you're taking at that particular human behavior. So that having taken, we, we created a technology architecture which enhanced us to inbuilt security enhancement inside. While this is one use case, other use case, of course, a lot of possibilities of the manufacturing items do go out of the out of the out of the out, out of the border, and there you need to have a traceability enhancement on that because we do serve to Bangladesh from India plants, and that has to go through the West, and we do service to ASEAN countries, and we have inbuilt those traceability inbuilt into the components, and we take those in a very very measured way. As Joey mentioned, it's not the end. We constantly keep looking at it. There is a 24 bar seven data center has been, and also with the security of that data centers, we look at those possibilities as detail as possible. But it's not the end. We keep learning and we keep updating our algorithms as we require. So to envision a potential threat coming in to that potential threat going further. I just want to add something. Uh, to to what we were talking about, may I? Yes, please. Uh, the earlier question from Hitesh. One other thing that I um, understand to be a very effective way of reducing um, cyber crime, or at least warding off attacks as much as possible, is to actually be cyber aware. And uh, there's not enough understanding, and there's not enough adoption of um, cyber you know, t tackling and adopting measures to sort of not be a victim of cyber crime. And uh, again, uh, through my conversations and research, I discovered we have a we have a very eminent researcher in Deakin University who's um, doing some work again here. The, the, the university is doing work in India. Talked about community awareness. There's one thing being aware of cyber crime, but the other thing is to make it to actually enforce behavioral change. A bit like the um, slip slop slap campaign that we had in Australia several years ago where people actually had the message that skin cancer was bad for you but then they had that other message which was don't just learn that skin cancer can come to you because we're where we are but do something about it and slap on some sunscreen so I think with 
with us being able to address it, we have to become smarter, uh, each one of us, and actually maybe a behavioral change um, awareness campaign that could be adopted to make communities understand the importance of being cyber aware would be something to think about. And I attribute that idea to, um, to Damien Manuel from um, Deacon. Yeah, I think it's a really smart idea, a smart concept, Joey. I'll give you a quick, really quick example. I'm of the view that uh, just like we teach our kids to wash their hands at school, uh, we should teach them to uh, a bit more about how to be cyber secure in this environment. It needs to go down to that, that level from my point of view. I think they're the makings of an India Australia campaign for this. I agree, completely agree. We'll take that away. We'll get back to you. Uh, thanks very much for that, guys. Um, Ayush, question for you: um, Considering the current worldwide situation, is it conducive for businesses in Australia to invest and transform digitally? If so. What could be the prevalent business opportunities for Indian and global organisations to provide digital transformation, document content, management solutions and other related services in Australia? Uh, this is a question from uh, Kavaseri Fishwanthan Subramanian and uh, uh, noting and, and mentioning also specific industry vertical segments uh, would be really quite useful. Uh, over to you, Ayush. Yeah, this this is a difficult one. Um, you're asking me to put my management consulting hat on and 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 give you the um the, the keys to the world. Uh, if I had those, trust me, I'd be using them myself. But I think definitely one one area which is uh, you would if you have the skills and you have some know how that you would really want to get involved in is the topic for our conversation today, and that's cybersecurity. Um, you, you see, unlike uh, Unlike uh, social media, unlike instant messaging, unlike um, uh, you know email, um, cybersecurity has been foisted upon us. It's it's a byproduct of the decisions that we've made, and so as Juhi said before, we're constantly playing catch up, right? And even when we talk to our clients and we do work with them, the first thing we tell them is, look, this is not about being a hundred percent secure or, or or resilient. You won't get there. The idea with cybersecurity is that you need to be uh, uh when when you get attacked you need to minimize the scope of the breach and if you do that you're winning already all right now in terms of the opportunities that australian companies have in particular um australia is well known uh well at least internally australia is well known for producing really smart innovations right i'll give you an example there's a company called atlassian um you may not have heard of Atlassian, but you would have heard of Jira and you would have heard of Confluence and you would have heard of the, some of their products, uh, which are used around the world in, by millions of people to create really cool pieces of software and technology, right? And I think uh, with the investment that the Australian government is putting in, I think we'll start to see a lot of uh, these smaller or niche players, if you like, come out of Australia to tackle some of these global threats, right? Uh, obviously, we hope to play a part in that from uh, our cyber chief perspective and also from the services that we provide. But I think uh, one of the things that, uh, despite the populations being so different, one of the things that entrepreneurs in Australia and India have is the willingness to compete and compete hard, right? In Australia, to get on top, you're dealing with a small market, so you've got to be the best. You've got to provide a really, really amazing solution. In India, just to get above the noise, you have to be the best. You would provide a really amazing solution, right? And I think this comprehensive strategic partnership that the governments have now enables uh, enables that cooperation to go to the next level, um, to continue sharing information not only from uh, you know from, uh, from a government to government level, but also as Julia alluded to before, in between companies, so that we can make sure that um, we're doing all that we can to increase the resilience of not just the corporate world, but also society at large. Um, actually, I'll, I'll point this out, um, uh, if I may, Pat. Um, one of the things that uh, you should do, uh, what, this question relates to how do we go about digital transformation and uh, in, in this world, right, in this, in this COVID era. Uh, I think 
uh, and, and Lokesh was talking about IoT devices. The most common IoT device in our house these days is uh, a, a router or a, um, a CCTV, a security camera, right? Now, uh, most people don't change the admin passwords on their routers, right? Uh, they, they keep it as a default. So anyone who knows a little bit about routers can get in pretty simply, pretty easily. There's a Russian website that streams 24-7 uh, images from CCTV cameras around the world where uh, people have not changed the, the admin password, right? So in terms, of, in terms of simple things we can do, it goes around uh, making sure that uh, we are personalizing the tech that we're using. Uh, we're constantly increasing the awareness of how this tech actually impacts us uh, beyond just the convenience aspects of it. And hopefully um, holding some of these uh, vendors, some of these companies that make this tech, holding them to account and helping them, uh, making them help us you know, increase the, the resilience of the, of the technologies that we use. I think there's some really good points there, Ayush. Um, I don't know about anyone else on the on the on this session. Um, probably the first thing I'm going to do when I go home is change my Wi-Fi password from the there you go. default setting. I have to admit, um, it's probably there you a go. security practice for me to admit admit that to everyone over this call, perhaps. But um, um, likely we don't know where you live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so um, so we, yeah, so there you go. But um, look, I think thank you for that, and thanks to all our um, our expert panelists. Um, I think you've brought together a few different things we need to go away with. Um, uh, I think uh, Juhi, thanks for the really overarching sense of where we need to go and where we can bring universities in. Lakesh on uh, the Internet of Things, uh, businesses working across the region, and where we need to work together. And Ayush and uh, Juhi also bringing together the importance of on making an honest look at cyber safety. I know that's something the Australian government's put some money into recently, and there might be potential for us to look at doing things like that down the track. Um, just to wrap up, uh, High Commissioner, thanks very much for um, spending some time with us tonight and responding to the questions from our alumni. Um, I know from the comments that we really appreciated it. Um, we look forward to continuing to engage with you through this period of COVID-19. Um, I also want to thank the Australian Alumni Association of India um, who collaborated with us for putting this together. Uh, they are a great partner for us um, and they are a great network for uh, Australian alumni in India uh, to get to connect with each other and opportunities in business between Australia and India. So, uh, Without uh, anything else um, more to say, thank you all for coming and we look forward to you all participating next time. Thanks very much.